Praise God. Today is Pentecost Sunday, as Pastor Terry already mentioned. So let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for giving us your Bible to walk out our faith and that we can love one another in community and apply the principles of Scripture in the workplace and church place. So, Father, we give you the praise and the glory as we move forward and continue this Acts narrative in this present day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, I wrote this out this morning. I just tried to get a prophetic sense of what uh, God is saying, and I didn't really have it last night until almost right before I went to sleep, and I was too tired to write it out. So I said, let me get a good night's sleep and write it out this morning. But I really try to get a prophetic sense of, of what's needed. And uh, so I want to talk about the purpose of Pentecost. Someone say, purpose of Pentecost. Purpose of Pentecost. And so my objective today is to give the church a robust understanding of our Pentecostal purpose. Give us a purpose in our understanding of Pentecost. And so as I'm speaking, there's a few questions you could ask yourself. You could ask yourself, am I walking in the purpose of a spiritual life? Do I know the gospel? And am I a witness of Christ? Those are three key questions to ask yourself as we're going through this. The key text today is going to be Acts chapter 1, verses 1 uh, to 10. And I'm just going to read that, and then we're going to flow right into this message. And so in Acts chapter 1, Luke makes reference to his prior book, which is the Gospel of Luke, when he says in the first book, meaning Luke, talking about the Gospel, so he's connecting the Gospels to this book. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do. Some would say began. Began. That's a key. So in Luke, he wrote what Jesus began to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he had given commandments through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many infallible proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth." And right after that, he ascended into heaven. And so as we look at this, we see basically the framework for the whole book of of Acts. We see the purpose of Pentecost, and we see the purpose of the church. And uh, unfortunately, we have disconnected the church from our mission and our purpose. And Acts chapter 1 has been forgotten in many ways. And uh, human nature seems to be that way. Uh, You think of many of the things that are significant in history that have been changed or watered down, diluted. Uh, We don't even know the purpose of it anymore. This great country, the United States, was founded on certain principles, and now there are people interpreting the same principles in the Constitution, in the First Amendment, Second Amendment, etc., totally different from the founding, and it's like I'm wondering what what language am I reading, what constitution am I reading, and it's the same with what Bible am I reading sometimes, um, and uh, even things as simple as Christmas, you know, I'm guessing probably 80% of the young people don't even know Jesus Christ had something to do with Christmas, I think it has to do with Santa Claus and exchanging gifts, and even worse, probably with Easter. They probably have no clue it's connected to the resurrection of Christ. It's connected more to Easter hunts and, uh, you know, egg hunts and, and my favorite, chocolate. But that's another story. So, and we have seen the same thing in Pentecost. Uh, 
the evangelical church is not outside of the scope of turning things around or walking away from the purpose. When I think of the word Pentecostal today, I'm thinking about long dresses and legalism and, uh, you know, or speaking in tongues. And, or, you know, if you want to go into the charismatic movement, I'm thinking of soaking, chasing signs and wonders, uh, feeling something. And if you look at Acts chapter 1, you don't see any of that when it comes to the purpose of Pentecost. And so that's my objective today. Let's get back to the purpose. I have very direct personality. I don't like wasting time. I get right to the point. Um, and uh, some would say, well, that's a New York thing. Well, not even New Yorkers are like me. So, uh, so I'm not politically correct. I talk blunt because there are certain things that are so obvious in Scripture that you don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure it out or some spiritual mystic. It's just right here. So all I'm trying to do is bring out the plain text of the Word. And so let's just go back. He says in the first book, O Theophilus, I like that name, Theophilus. If I have another boy, I'll call him Theophilus. I don't know. <laughs> Sounds like theological or God and philosophy. I like that. So in the first book, O Theophilus, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do. I love that word began, which means that the book of Acts is what Jesus continues to do through his church. So that one part there frames the whole Acts narrative. It shows us the purpose of this book, this amazing book, which means that we should be Acts 29. We should be continuing to walk in the book of Acts, and it's 28 chapters, if you didn't know what I meant, and we're the 29th chapter on. And so he began to do something that he showed in the Gospel of Luke. By implication, this book now is part two. It's what he's going to continue to do. And as we see the book of Acts unpack, especially after the day of Pentecost, he does it through his church, which is why in John chapter 14 through 16, he told the church, he's going to leave. He told his disciples, his community, I'm going to leave, but don't worry, I'm not going to leave you as often. The Holy Spirit is going to come. It's another counselor, another comforter, and he's going to teach you all things. He's going to cause you to remember everything I said, show you things to come, and he's going to bear witness of me. He's going to take of mine and reveal it to you. And so the Spirit in his community is now taking a place of Jesus and continuing the work that Jesus started as elucidated in Luke chapter in uh, Gospel of Luke. So all that Jesus began to do frames this whole book. Then it says, and he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs. So there you have the basis for apologetics. It's historical. It's real. It's in time space. The resurrection and the life of Christ really happened. It's not just some spiritual thing. Uh, it's not just some enlightenment, but he showed himself alive by many, uh, King James would say, infallible proofs, appearing to them 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And so the book of Acts and the church is rooted in a true historical person, we are anchored on history. We're anchored on the meaning of, of history. We're anchored upon a person that brought to bear a resurrection which has implications with holding the whole world into account, with judging nations and holding every person accountable to the fact that he came, he lived, he died, he rose. It's historical. It's powerful. And so he showed himself alive, and then it says, and while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so... The promise of the Father is the Holy Spirit, as we know, given on the day of Pentecost, which was chapter 2, the next chapter. 
and it was given to enable the church to walk out the implications of what? The resurrection, his infallible proof that he walked the earth for 40 days talking about the kingdom of God, and now the promise of the Father is going to come. For what reason? To enable us to have the power to walk out the implications of this historical reality, this person. And then it says, their response was, well, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So they knew that there was going to be a culmination in history where uh, kingdom reign manifest on the earth through Christ would eventually take place. But it's quite amazing to me that even after walking with him for three and a half years and then hearing him teach on the kingdom for 40 days, how would you like to sit under Jesus for 40 days and 40 nights? They still didn't get it. They still wondered if he was going to restore the kingdom at this time. It's amazing how we understand some truths, but we hardly ever get the timing of it right. And uh, that's what the problem is with a lot of personal prophecies. People get a word, and they start acting on it right away. Meanwhile, it might be 30 years of process and pain before you could fulfill it. And so uh, I think they were walking in a lot of pain, of course, because there was a lot of oppression through the unconverted Jewish leaders, through Rome. Uh, oppressing Israel with high taxation. So they just thought, hey, man, can we just get out of this persecution? Can we get out of this oppression? Can we get away from uh, being under the thumb of Rome? And uh, oftentimes a lot of the Christians today, their motivation is more, uh, let's live an affluent life. Let's get out of the oppression. Let's get out of the you know, uh, the political turmoil, and I, I just want Jesus to rescue me right now. And that cannot be our motivation. Jesus immediately got them back on track, and he said, it is not for you to know the day, the times, or the seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. He didn't deny that ultimately he's going to restore his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Um, he didn't deny the fact that eventually that is going to happen. But he got them back on track for the now. And a lot of the Christians today are involved in speculative theology and eschatology and chasing things, blood moons, this moon, that moon, this Sabbath, this, that, and the other thing. And I, quite frankly, I, some of these prophetic people, I don't even understand what they're talking about when they teach. Numer numerical things and this and that and I'm thinking what does it have to do with what I have to do now that's really what Jesus is saying you don't need to know the times of the season but I love this you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you you will receive power the focus was upon receiving real life ability that's what Jesus is into. For what reason? And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so the church even now has to be refocused. Instead of all the speculation, instead of chasing, well, who's the Antichrist? When is the temple mount going to be, uh, the temple going to be built? And when is this? And, that? and it's like, uh, let's focus on the main thing right now, being his witnesses. Being his witnesses. That's why we have the power of the Holy Ghost. That's why we get baptized in the Spirit. We don't get baptized in the Spirit so we can speak in tongues. I don't want to deflate your bubble there, but this is what I, when I was taught in Pentecostal circles. The focus is on speaking in tongues. You get baptized in the Holy Ghost so you can speak in tongues. The proof is you speak in tongues. Now, that could be true. It could be a sign that you're baptized in the Spirit, but that's not the focus. A lot of tongue talk is not good witness. The focus is on being his witness. I'd rather not speak in tongues and be a good witness. If you speak in tongues all day, but you're not a good witness, you're defeating the purpose of Pentecost. So he said the purpose is to be his witness. And I love that. It's to witness of Jesus. It's not for self-actualization. It's not so you can feel good. It's not so you can be slain in the Spirit. It's not so you can get prophetic words. It's not so you could soak. It's not so you could find out who you really are. It's 
to be his witness. It's about him and not about you. It's not about seven steps to your happiness. It's about being his witness. That's a profound little statement. Yet it kind of like paints the whole picture of the whole Bible. Just a little thing I want to throw in there. So the whole Bible is all about that. It's about Jesus. And right here, we have an intersection of several things. We have the kingdom, we have Jesus, we have the church and the mission, all showing the purpose of Pentecost. So all of what I said right in the last 20 minutes is an introduction. Now we're going to get into the meat. What is the purpose of Pentecost? And so he said, you will be my witnesses. So number one, the purpose of Pentecost is all about Jesus, not about us. The baptism of the Spirit is so we can powerfully bear witness of a person named Jesus. The whole biblical narrative points to him. Luke 24, verse 25, Jesus said to the two disciples that were walking with him on the road to Emmaus, he said, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ, they still didn't know Jesus was talking to them, that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, the Torah, the Ketuvim, the Nevim, the three components of the Hebrew canon, he interpreted to them all the scriptures taught concerning himself. Verse 44 of chapter 24 in Luke he said to now all his disciples, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law and the prophets and the Psalms, the three components of the Hebrew canon, must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Lord, open our minds that we could understand its spirit and its life. It's not just rational. Open our minds so we could understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Now this is Luke 24. You see how it sounds like Acts 1. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So we see in Acts 20, I'm sorry, in Luke 24 in two sections, starting with verse 25, then with verse 44, Jesus says that the whole Bible speaks of him. Now, this is not just talking about Bible prophecies. Most evangelical Christians think, yeah, 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 I got to find a Bible prophecy, a messianic prophecy about Jesus. No, no, no. What he's saying is a lot more than that. He's saying the whole Bible, every part of the Bible speaks about him not just things that we think of prophecies. And that's too deep of a subject to get into on a Sunday morning. But just so that you understand, it, it's very hard to find one prophecy that talks about his death, burial, and resurrection. Um, but if you look at the whole biblical narrative, you could see that whole um, uh, thing stated. So what we want to do is, what does it mean to be his witness? Well, first of all, to be his witness, we have to understand the purpose of the Gospels. Now, what I'm about to say is going to be real quick, but I could take about four hours to teach on this. But I'm going to just go quickly through this, give you enough to think about it, then you could dive into it on your own. But we have to have a, a more robust understanding of the Gospels. The, biblical, uh, the typical evangelical understanding of the Gospels is it's a good story, but the real meat is the last six hours of Christ. You know, when he's on the cross, that's the Gospel. Well, if that's true, then why does it say in Mark chapter 1 that Jesus began preaching the Gospel? He was preaching the Gospel three and a half years before he went on the cross. The Gospel is not just the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's the culmination of it. It's a lot more than the four spiritual laws. And what I want to do is quickly unpack what is the gospel, what is the good news. The gospel, if you read Mark, Luke, uh, John, uh, Matthew, you will find all of this in there. One, you will find 
that the gospel is about the restoration of the cosmic temple that rejoins heaven and earth. Theologians, many scholars believe that Genesis 1, the way the heavens and the earth were created, was it was made in the framework of a temple. The whole universe is God's sanctuary, not just the church building for two hours. The whole universe was, was made so that heaven and earth would intersect together, that there was no bifurcation, there was no dualism, there was no distinction between material and spiritual in a sense where there was always an interaction, an intersection. That's why when Adam uh, was created, he walked with God, even though God is spirit and Adam had a physical body, because before the fall, it was all one cosmic sanctuary with the most holy place on the earth in the Garden of Eden there, if you want to use that term. And so after the fall, we know that there was a horrible divide between the natural and the spiritual world. Uh, death was introduced. Adam didn't have fellowship with God anymore. And the whole understanding of, of the earth being part of a sanctuary that God made so that he could walk with us, so that heaven and earth can intersect together, was messed up. And so then God chose Israel to be a nation of priests. That's why we find in Exodus 25, they constructed a tabernacle or a tent where God would then meet. And that became the epicenter of the earth. Israel is that nation of priests meant to bring the earth back to God. But of course, Israel wound up messing up. And then we find, of course, many parts of this. There was Solomon's temple, the rebuilding of the temple after that was destroyed, but none of the Jews thought that the presence of God came in that second temple. They were still waiting for the time when the presence of God would come. It wasn't in Herod's temple. It wasn't in that temple that existed during the time of Christ. But Jesus said, you destroy this temple and I'll build it in three days. John 2, verse 19 to 21. And then it says, he was referring to the temple of his body. The Bible teaches us that Jesus became the temple that restored heaven and earth and the intersection between the spirit and natural world. That's what the Gospels teach us, how Jesus became the new temple, uniting heaven and earth, man and God. Again, here's another thing. Genesis 1.1, it says... That in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness stood upon the face of the deep and, deep. and God said, let there be light, and there was light, etc. Well, similar to that, we find in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.1 1, 1 preceded Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, because that Word, then it says in verse 3, made all things, and apart from him was nothing made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Well, now we know why there was light before God created the stars in Genesis 1, because it says in him was life, and that life was the light of the world. The light shines in the darkness. Darkness doesn't understand it. So the second thing the Gospels teach us is that Jesus is the new Genesis, he is the one who recreated and renewed. That's why he said, I'm bringing a new heaven and a new earth. He's the one who reconstituted the earth. By being that temple, he began the process of renewing all things, which is why we find in John 19, when Jesus breathed his last, before he did that, he said, it is finished, mimicking the words of God after he created all things, rested on the seventh day, and he said, it is finished. What Jesus is saying is, it is done. I've now recreated, began the process of recreating all things. Jesus came to renew and restore the fallen world of creation, not just save you and send you to heaven. The third thing we find when we look in the Gospels is Jesus became the new Adam. The first Adam was called to have dominion over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, and over every creeping thing that creeps. The cultural mandate, Genesis 1.28. Well, Jesus was called uh, the last Adam by uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15.45. 
And we see in John 1, 14, how the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word flesh means he became the last Adam, the perfect man meant to fulfill everything the first Adam didn't fulfill. And that's why he had dominion over every aspect of creation, walked on water, healed the sick, multiplied bread. He is the last Adam, showed his dominion over creation, and he then bestowed that upon his church who ought to walk in his image. Isn't that powerful? The word became flesh, has deep implications to fulfill the cultural mandate through the church. Uh, Romans 5 talks about how the first Adam fell and brought condemnation to all men, but the last Adam brought justification of life so that we could reign in life with him. Romans 5, 12 to 22, basically. By one man's disobedience, death reigned upon all, but through the obedience of the one came life to all who were in Christ. Very powerful. So Jesus is the new Adam came to fulfill that which the first Adam messed up. That is our call to culture, not just to a building on Sunday for two hours. Here's another aspect of Jesus. Why are we going to be his witness? The gospel is so robust. I hope this just blows open the gospel for you. And you start seeing so many more things than just the last six hours on the cross or nice moral platitudes for us to live by. And uh, here's another thing. The The gospel shows the fourth thing here, the fulfillment of the story of Israel. Jesus is the new Israel. Jesus is the continuation of the story of Israel that God brought out of Egypt. That's why it tells us in Matthew when Joseph was warned in a dream to flee Egypt, They said it was a prophecy fulfilled, which I don't know of any prophecy in the Old Testament. Out of Israel, I called my son. It sounded similar to something in Hosea, but there's really no passage until I understand. Wait a minute. What that is saying is Jesus is Israel. Jesus is the culmination of Israel. He is the Israel story. And uh, that's why he said in Mark chapter 1, The time is fulfilled. Repent and believe the gospel. What does he mean, the time is fulfilled? Well, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, it said that 490 years or 70 weeks are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy place. And then it says when this is going to happen, it's going to be 490 years from the rebuilding of the temple. They were expecting, because they calculated from the time Nehemiah built the temple, the time of Christ, they were expecting a Messiah. And that's why when Jesus came, he said, the time is fulfilled. I am the one to seal a prophecy, to bring an end of iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness. I'm the one who's going to fulfill the whole narrative of Israel. Isn't that powerful? I'm going real fast. Like I said, I could spend hours on each one of these. Jesus is the new Exodus. Here's the fifth thing. Exodus, the story of when God took the Jews out of slavery and bondage. It's no accident that Jesus died on what? The Passover. He died on the Passover. I would have thought he would have died on the Day of Atonement. Died on the Passover And when he was going to teach his people about what he was about to do, he didn't try to give a theological lecture. He had a supper, communion, that taught something words could never teach, a theology could never teach. And so he had this last supper, and basically what he's saying is the Exodus story was only a type and a mere pittance and shadow of the fact that you're really looking for Messiah, for someone to come to really deliver you, not just out of physical slavery, but out of emotional, spiritual, out of the slavery that came upon the whole human race. I am the one to bring the new exodus. Powerful, powerful stuff. It's Romans 6 is all about him delivering us from sin. And the Passover meal, communion, all of this depicts that. Number six, the sixth thing the Gospels are about 
is the restoration of God as king of the earth. We find that God calls himself king over the whole earth. Israel wanted a person to be their king instead of God, and they insulted God. We find that in 1 Samuel chapter 8. So they, God gave them Saul, and uh, of course, you know how that went. The whole thing went south and terrible things. And uh, now we have all these presidents and kings and potentates throughout history trying to take the place of God, and it always fails. There's no political leader, political system uh, that is ever going to be perfect because ultimately the way it was supposed to be from the beginning was God is the king of the earth, declare the Psalms. Well, when Jesus came, he didn't just come to be your savior when he was having a conversation with king who's having a conversation with a leader, a potentate in Rome, Pontius Pilate. Of course, what did they talk about? They talked about power and truth. And uh, Pilate basically said, your own people delivered you to me. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. He didn't say my kingdom is not in the world. He said, it's not of the world, meaning I don't derive my power from you, chump. I don't derive my power from Rome. I don't derive my power from the Democratic Party or the Republican Party or the American flag or the French flag. I don't, my kingdom is not of, the source of its power is not from this world. He said, if it was, then my servants would come and fight. I could bring legions of angels right now to knock the whole Roman Empire out. He said, so Pilate said, so you are a king? He says, it was for that reason I was born, to bear witness of the truth. You cannot separate the gospel, the truth, from the reign of God. When you try to separate the gospel from the kingdom, and all you have left is the rapture or feeling good or happiness or escapism. Jesus said, being king and truth are, you can't separate that, irrevocable. And so the gospel is about the res- restoration of God as king. Number seven, the gospel shows that revelation is God being the only true champion and hero who came to vanquish all of our enemies. Isaiah 9, 6 says for us, to us, a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God. That word Mighty God in Hebrew is El Gabor, Hero, Champion, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. David, uh, when he slew Goliath, he was a type of Christ. It wasn't an accident that Jesus came from uh, the tribe of, of Judah, descendant of David, and David was able to slay Goliath. Goliath was a type of Satan, um, uh, the main enemy that we have. And that's why it says, for this reason, the Son of Man appeared, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus is our champion. He is our El Gabor. He is our hero. We don't need all these Marvel comics and Batman and Superman. That's all fun. I like watching some of them. But at the end of the day, they're only a mere pittance, a type and shadow of the innate desire of humanity to long for a true hero, true deliverer, a true Messiah, a true champion. Jesus is our El Gabor, our champion He's the one who slew out Goliath. And so when it says the purpose of Pentecost is to be his witness, wow, I just gave you seven little tidbits here to chew on. Hopefully your gospel is a lot bigger now than just the last six hours. And there's so much in there. But the second thing that shows the purpose of Pentecost, that's only the first thing. He says, I want you to be my witnesses where now it's connected to our mission. I want you to be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Wow, that's powerful. We are to be a witness of this person that fulfilled all these things in the gospel in Jerusalem. What does that mean? First of all, He's saying that we are to be his witness in cities. Never said in a building on Sunday for two hours. I just dropped a nuclear bomb. We 
a call to plant the good news of Jesus Christ, not just the good news of motivational speeches and practical things and how-tos and all this, that a lot of what you hear on Sunday mornings and, and, you know, on television, at the end of the day, if it's not about Jesus, it's not good news. We ought to be his witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, meaning we ought to plant the gospel in cities. There's no difference between workplace and church place. We shouldn't even have to say marketplace leaders. If we really get back to the nitty-gritty of what the Word of God says, the gospel is planted in cities. It doesn't say in buildings, meaning that you ought to be a witness in every aspect of your Jerusalem. Jerusalem also stands for a mono uh, cultural kind of context, meaning it's people like you, that look like you, talk like you, have your values. In Jerusalem, you know, they were all Jews. So the first thing you do is you reach people that are like you ethnically. They look like you. They have the same culture. And that's the first thing. You, you start with your family, your friends, and people around you. But then he says, I want you to be my witness in Judea. Well, that means you're not just going to stay in your nice little enclave and your nice little community. By implication, you're going to multiply and you're going to start reaching your region. Judea means, by implication, you're an apostolic church. You don't just impact your community, you impact beyond your community. But then he says Samaria. What does Samaria stand for? Well, the Samaritans and the Jews hated each other. So when Jesus said, I want you to be my witness in Samaria, that was really challenging. That is, go to those who ideologically oppose you, who religiously hate you, have their own uh, uh, worldview, your own, their own way of thinking, even of the Bible. Yeah. Oftentimes, Christians are just comfortable with their own little crowd, their own little people. It's easy to be in an amen corner. It's easy to preach to the choir. But how about going amongst those who hate you, going against those who are totally against what you believe in politics, what you believe in, in, in worldview, what you believe in philosophy. Jesus challenges the church when he says to go to, Jeru to uh, uh, Samaria, go to people that don't look like you, think like you, and instead of being threatened, why not build bridges Amen. and love those who hate Christians? That's what he was saying. If you're going to fast forward, if he was here today. In 9-11, when that atrocity took place in 2001, and I was right there and worked with the, uh, the powers that be to help train clergy, to bring counselors and all of that. Two days after 9-11, I, I was in the Empire State Building stuck in New York overnight. So I saw every, I saw the towers collapsing. I was right there in the midst of all the chaos, and nobody even knew. The cops didn't even know what was going on at that point. Um, by the time I got home on Wednesday night, the next day the Lord told me, I want you to go to the nearest mosque. I want you to wear your clergy collar. This is a time to build bridges. And while everybody was hating the Muslims and cursing them, God said, I want you to build bridges right now because everybody hates them. Now's your opportunity. So I put on my clergy collar, took my shoes off, went into a mosque, and I just stood there. Within a minute, three guys whisked me away, brought me into the office, and the head imam came in. And he said, what are you doing here? What do you want? And I gave them my card. I said, I'm a community leader, and I want you to know that we're not, we're not blaming every Muslim for this. And if there's anything I can do as a community leader, if people start persecuting you, hating you, do anything, call me. I'm a pastor in this community. And the guy was like, and he hugged me, and the head guy in that mosque started weeping, and all of his bodyguards started weeping. It was one of the most powerful moments I ever had. I remember there was a cop outside, and... He was so angry. I said, is this mosque open now? He says, I don't care. And he started cussing. I don't care. Someone blows this place up right now. And I understood that. I didn't condemn him. And everybody has a right to be angry, obviously. But we have to transcend Amen. partisan politics, right, left, red, blue, uh, gay, straight, all of this, and go to no man's land Amen. where they hate us. 
and watch God show off his stuff. I think God gets bored when all we do is preach to people like us. I don't just watch Fox News. I watch CNN. I read the New York Times. I read, you know, it's like I don't want to be stuck in one little bubble. I want to understand everyone's perspective so that when I'm in the company of anybody that I meet, especially in New York City, I know what to say. I know how to be a witness. And then he says, go to the ends of the earth. Wow, if Samaria was a challenge, not only are you going to a place, you know, some places, you know, there was cannibalism, there was, it's polytheistic, meaning many gods, at least Samaria believed in one god, polyglot, meaning many languages. When Jesus told us to go to the ends of the earth, he said, I want you to be contextual, I want you to be cultural anthropologist. I want you to study languages. I want you to study other people. I want you to love human beings the way I do that are made of my image. I want you to go to places that are totally alien to your context. And in order to do that, not only do we have to study, but we have to multiply leaders, other apostolic leaders. If we're going to plant the gospel in every nation, we have to constantly make disciples. And we have to multiply and proliferate across the earth so that eventually the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord like the waters cover the sea. Wow. And last but not least, purpose of Pentecost spelled out in the first message ever preached on Pentecost. Peter got up. He preached an amazing message when people were wondering, what's going on here? They thought they were drunk, and Peter said, no, no, it's not, we're not drinking now. It's only 9 o'clock. That means maybe he drank later. I don't know what he meant by that. <laughs> it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. He said, these guys aren't drunk. We break out the bottles later on, but um, he said, and then he explained what happened, why they were speaking in tongues, quoting the book of Joel, chapter 2, starting with verse 16, and he ends this glorious message saying these words in verse 38 of Acts 2. He said when they, they were cut to the heart, and they said, what are we going to do? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. What a powerful name. The culmination of everything this world is all about. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, For this promise, I love this, is to you and to your children. Someone say to me and my children. And then he says, and for all that are far off, for the children that are far off. What Peter did on the first Pentecostal message, the first message of the church, is he said, the gospel is generational. Pentecost means that you're passing your faith down to your children your biological and spiritual children. If Pentecostal doesn't mean you just speak in tongues, then you're not really Pentecostal. You're just a glossolalianist. You just engage in glossolalia. That's all. That's the Greek word for tongues. But if you're really Pentecostal, you're going to be his witness. You're going to have his power to go to places that most people don't want to go. You're going to let God show off his stuff, and you're going to pass your faith to your children's children. Because this promise is not just for you, it's for your children and for children that are far off for generations to come. God bless you.